Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I've got a new plant video for you guys today, introducing a species from one of my favorite little groups of sundews. I have for you Drosera serpents today. This is one of three species of the Arachnopus or spider leaf sundew group that I have had uh, success and an opportunity to uh, grow so far. The other two that I've worked with are Finlaysoniana and Hartmeyerorum that I've had success with, and we may visit those at some point in the future once I've got them growing again. Um, the Arachnopus group, the spiderleaf sundews, are a fairly widespread uh, group, at least in terms of one particular species. The type species, Drosera indica, is found uh, from central tropical Africa into Southeast Asia, but other species like these guys are found throughout Southeast Asia and the center of diversity is in tropical northern Australia. So this species, Drosera serpens, is found uh, in tropical northern Australia all across from uh, Western Australia through Queensland up through Southeast Asia, so Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Indochina. They're even found all the way up into uh, Japan, southern China, and over into India at least. So it is an extremely widespread species and also a fairly uh, variable species due to that wide range and all the varying gene eh, genetics that goes into a plant being that widespread. <clears throat> They're named spider leaf sundews, of course, because of those long slender spreading leaves that they have and in some cases some of these species like Drosera nana are extremely small they only get to a couple of inches tall and maybe an inch or two wide others like Drosera indica, Drosera serpens, Finlaysoniana there are some populations where they can produce plants that can grow well over a foot tall or in the case of these guys scrambling to well over a foot as you can see these have been growing for a while and with leaves that can be six to eight inches long, so you have a foot to 18 inch wide plant. Uh, they are a species that actually has movable leaves as well, so when insects are trapped on these leaves, uh, not only the tentacles like most sundews will fold in to digest the insect, but the entire leaf may also fold over as well. So it's a very active plant, slow moving in general because that is a movement that takes minutes to hours to happen so you can't really see it like with the naked eye it takes a long time to do so but they are a moving plant like many sundews are now the arachnopus group is often uh, told apart the different species are distinguished one by the fact that they tend to not hybridize at all you try and cross them and it won't work and hybrids are never recorded in the wild either even if the plants are growing right next to each other and look almost identical but they're also not just genetically separated like that they're often told apart by the glands that they produce on the leaves and on the stems so of course you can see they have the long slender leaves the sticky tentacle glands like most sundews have but then at the base of the leaf some of them have pedials where they don't have those sticky tentacles Others don't have that pedial at all. That's one uh, trait used. But then they also have these specialized glands in different shapes and forms on those pedials or on the stems if they don't have the pedials, or both. In the case of Drosera serpens, the uh, primary glands that distinguish them are these tiny little kind of yellowish mushroom shaped glands that will grow off of the stem just below the leaves and tiny red glands also just below the leaves as well as on the pedial they have these tiny little y-shaped glands and that stick up Now these are microscopic I've got a video here that I'll show uh, that I tried to zoom in to show them and I might throw in a photo as well to show better but these are things you either need really good eyes to see or you need a magnifying glass or a microscope to actually view them uh, other species have different variations of sometimes those same glands or other different glands entirely. And some of them are truly unique in some of the glands that they have. Like Hartmeyer aurum has these big, bulbous, yellow-topped uh, hairs or glands that 
might be an insect attractant or it's kind of a mystery still. Other species, the glands produce interesting scents or they just have these odd colors to them. Now, Drosera serpens is, overall, it's fairly uniform in its, in its appearance, even across uh, its range. It's got these big, tall leaves. Uh, the stems, especially, will develop reddish colors over time as they age. The leaves usually are uh, bright green, sometimes with reddish tentacles. There are some versions out there, though, where the entire plant may actually turn almost completely red. But they generally have this same really spindly growth pattern. Now, despite the size of these plants, you might be surprised to realize these are annuals. So the, in the wild, a lot of the places where they grow are places that have a distinctive wet and dry season. So the plants will grow, uh, they'll germinate right as the wet season hits. They'll eat as many little insects as they can possibly capture, secreting enzymes uh, out of those tentacles and then digesting the insect, reabsorbing what they need out of that, which is mostly things like phosphorus and nitrogen. But they grow very quickly, gathering as much nutrients as they can, and then they flower, uh, producing these flower stalks that kind of unfurl from the sides of the growth point and upward. Uh, that'll produce anywhere from one to almost two dozen flowers each fairly large, and most of these guys, they are bright pink, or at least in this species, most of the flowers are bright pink. There are some white flowered forms, but they'll do that. And then if they fed well enough, all those flowers will set seeds, the seeds will be sown, and then the plants die. And then they're replaced the next year by uh, the next generation. As the, during the dry season, there's nothing to support these guys. In some places where it's continuously wet, like in certain areas of uh, Queensland, perhaps, or uh, tropical Southeast Asia, you might have areas where it's constantly wet. And you may see these guys continually growing for more than a single uh, typical season. So in those cases, they can get truly immense in some, in some cases. But overall, they live for a season, so six months to a year, then they die off the next wet season comes in and they're replaced by their offspring. Now in cultivation, they are, you can give them even better conditions sometimes. So they don't have to dry out in, in cultivation here, so they can often just keep growing. But they are somewhat hardwired in some ways to grow as annuals and there are specific uh, needs that they have in order to push them to grow longer than that. These guys here have actually been growing since before I moved to the new house here. So these are plants that are over any, a year and a half at least, possibly two years old. Some of the younger ones, like this guy that's sprouting up right here, of course, are new. But some of the oldest ones here might have been growing for over two years now. And they've been doing so for two reasons. One, the pot that they're in, and you notice it's not a huge pot. They don't have huge roots in this case. Uh, just enough to kind of give them moisture and keep them supported. But the pot never dries out. And these guys are constantly fed, whether by me uh, manually, giving them uh, dried fruit flies or fish food flakes or maxi fertilizer, uh, whatever works for what you might have, uh, or they are catching their own insects. So the pesky fungus gnats that fly around the greenhouse here, these guys help to get rid of a lot of those. And if we look really close on the leaves, I'll probably have to do another video, put it in here to show you. There are fungus gnats captured all over the leaves of these guys. So because they are catching those all the time, they're getting constantly fed. And so they can just keep on growing. They keep producing new flower stalks like right there. Uh, and just keep going and going and going. So as long as you keep them fed and keep them wet, they're naturally annuals, but they can be grown as at least short-term perennials. Same goes for a lot of other annual species like uh, Drosera bermanii, which many people are familiar with. If you feed them well, you can get over their tendency to flower themselves to death or simply wilt eventually and die and allow them to grow from multiple seasons. Now, this is a fairly easy plant to set up uh, for cultivation, of course. Um, this species in particular is not 
picky about its soil. Some of the other ones in its little group, the Arachnopus group, are a little more picky. So things like Hartmeyer aurum, Cuculata, and so on need a really nice sandy soil, much like what they have in their native environment. But this one, it's just about any good carnivorous plant soil and you're good to go. So whether that's my standard is like the one-to-one -one peat perlite mix or uh, I do a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one roughly uh, peat perlite and uh, blasting abrasive which is my sand substitute. But put that in the soil and keep it moist. You sow the seeds. The seeds don't require any special treatment because they are just waiting for the moisture to come through. Uh, one other important thing is in order to get them to germinate and then grow well is they like it warm. Again, these are a tropical species and they are a tropical lowland plant. So they grow where it is hot. So in the same place as the Pediolaris, the woolly sundews grow in many places in Australia is where you'll find these. Uh, right alongside some of the tropical lowland uh, pitcher plants, Nepenthes, you'll also find these. And Drosa burmanii, a lot of people know, is a heat lover as well they grow in the same places that this plant grows in. So you keep it warm, so 80, 85 degrees or warmer in order to get the seeds to sprout well and get them growing. Now the seeds usually take, the, fast one, the fastest ones might take four or five weeks to germinate, maybe a little less even. Others may stay dormant and wait to germinate for several months. So if you don't see anything popping up immediately, patience and maybe a heat pad. But if you keep them warm, you keep them, or you wait until they start sprouting, they are extremely tiny, as most sundews are when they first start out. Uh, at that stage, it's really hard to feed them, so uh, you can hope that you have a good colony of springtails going on in your collection, and that'll feed them, or the fungus gnats, because the little guys will also catch those. But once they get big enough for you to start feeding them, the most important thing and the best thing to get them up to a nice big size like this is feed them heavily and feed them regularly. So at least every couple of weeks, scatter some fish food or put some liquid fertilizer that's appropriate for carnivores onto the leaves, let them feed. And then hopefully, given just a couple of months, you'll see a plant that reaches four, five, six inches tall. And over a few more months, a foot plus tall or long. And at that point, you'll start to see them flower. Most of the time, these guys don't need any special treatment to us. Uh, they will self-pollinate on their own. They are auto-self-pollinators. If you want maybe even better seed set or you want some diversity, you can manually uh, take pollen between the flowers or rub two flowers together to cross-pollinate them. But that's usually not necessary. As long as they're getting fed well, they will set a fairly heavy seed set. And then it's just a matter of keep the ones that are going uh, fed and they'll keep growing. If you want to just start a new colony all together, take some of those seeds, sow them, and you're good to go. Now, again, this is the mo easiest species, at least for me, to grow out of this group. But there are several others, and hopefully I will be able to talk about them in the future. But that is about all that I have for this species right now. Now, if there is something that I have missed about that species, or if there's something about its relatives that you'd like to know right about now, uh, you can go on to my website, carltoncarnivores.com, and go to the tab that is marked the database. I actually have all of the species of the, react, uh, the arachnopus in the database under the files. So you go database, carnivorous plants section, and then go down to Drosera. You'll find a section that says the arachnopus group, the spider leaf sundews. All of the species have their own files there. So that's just a short little blip about uh, their description and then a little bit of how to grow them. And for the species that I've, that I've dealt with, there's info on my personal experiences with growing them. So if you enjoy educational videos like this, uh, consider joining as a supporting member at patreon.com slash hcarlton. Uh, members there do get extra benefits such as access to the monthly seed contests that I do, early access to these videos before I release them publicly on YouTube, as well as there's exclusive merchandise that is uh, given to the members of higher tiers. Uh, if you don't want to do a monthly subscription, donations can also be taken through Coffee. The links for that will be in the description below the video here, or you can buy stuff at my website, carltoncarnivores.com. I have all sorts of plants for sale, sometimes baby reptiles as well, if you're looking for a new pet. Um, I also have 
resin gem jewelry made from the snake skins, the sheds that the snakes give me. Uh, you can also just give donations through PayPal and such. Or if you can't do monetary donations, um, you can support simply by giving attention to this channel. Uh, giving a like to the video, commenting down below, subscribing so you don't miss videos that are coming up. All of those things really help and it'll push the channel closer to the point where we can monetize it and I can get paid just for doing these videos for you guys. And of course, if you're looking just for more information, you can find me on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, at Carlton Carnivores. I'm always posting more videos and little tidbits all the time. But until next time, I'm Hawk and Carlton, and this is Carlton Carnivores. Okay.